Welcome to the final installment in our briefing series on Talpa, which we've titled Applying Talpa. Up to this point, we've talked about the various elements of Talpa, including contamination classification, runway condition assessment, field condition reporting, and runway condition. In this briefing, we'll see how pilots use field condition notums and the new runway condition codes to assess takeoff and landing performance on a contaminated runway. We'll also go over how the runway condition assessment matrix serves as a decision-making aid, especially during the time of arrival landing performance assessment. And we'll look at the very important role pilots play in the TALPA initiative by furnishing accurate, timely braking action reports. These reports help airport operators validate the reported runway conditions and serve as warnings that those conditions might be getting worse. Before we start, it's important to understand what TALPA is not. No process, no program, no tool yet invented can decide for the pilot whether it's safe to take off or land on a given runway. But as part of a safety risk management program, these are tools that can help the pilot make an informed decision. With the proper training, you as a pilot should know the performance requirements for takeoff or landing. This includes an understanding of the airplane's operating limitations found in both the airplane flight manual and in the operating rules. Complying with the operating limitations published in the AFM ensure that you'll be in compliance with the certification requirements for your airplane. However, as we've seen, these certification rules assume ideal runway conditions. While some operating rules try to account for the variables that aren't addressed by the certification rules, when the runway is contaminated, you might face surface conditions that are far less than ideal and not addressed by either rule. The purpose of TALPA has been to bridge this gap by providing decision support tools and improved performance data for use when runway conditions are less than ideal. Think of these tools as an extension of a broader safety risk management program designed to help flight crews calculate the risk of taking off or landing on a contaminated runway. These tools will not make the decision for you. They will help you make an informed decision by giving you a consistent description of the runway conditions that can be used with improved airplane performance data directly related to these conditions. This will help you decide whether the runway is adequate for your takeoff or landing. When taking off from a contaminated runway, pilots must know the type of contaminant and its depth to determine the aircraft's takeoff performance. As we'll see later in our briefing, the runway condition code is used to assess landing distance performance on a contaminated runway. However, the runway condition code will alert you to the fact that the runway is not dry and that a closer look at your aircraft's takeoff performance might be necessary. One of the most significant improvements resulting from the TALPA initiative is aligning the terms used by the FAA to report runway contamination with the terms used in calculating airplane performance on a contaminated runway. Not all reportable contaminants will have corresponding performance data, but where that data is provided, you should find the terms used in the runway field condition reports closely match the terms used with the airplane's performance data. Pilots should find it easier to use existing contaminated runway takeoff performance data with the new field condition notums. And this process should become even easier as manufacturers adopt FAA's latest guidance for developing contaminated runway takeoff data. Among the TAPA Initiative's biggest benefits are the tools pilots can use to assess landing performance based on the actual runway conditions at the time of arrival. Before takeoff, certificated operators have to assess the runways of intended use at the destination airport and the alternate if one is required. If you can't meet those requirements on a given runway, then you have to reduce your takeoff weight or, in some cases, designate an alternate airport. You must also be conservative in assessing conditions at your destination airport when the runway you plan to use might be wet. These requirements limit the takeoff weight and provide you with some degree of assurance that your airplane can safely land at the end of your trip. However, when the runway is contaminated with water, snow, slush, ice, or a combination of these contaminants, this pre-takeoff assessment might not be enough to ensure a safe landing upon arrival. 
Ideally, you should conduct your landing distance assessment after you get the latest weather and field conditions, preferably before the top of descent, so you can include that information in your approach briefing. Although the regulations don't specify the type of landing distance assessment to be performed or the safety margins that must be calculated at the time of arrival, the FAA suggests you perform an assessment to determine if you can safely land and stop the airplane under the existing or anticipated runway surface conditions. To be effective, the landing distance assessment should account for the relevant conditions you expect at the time of arrival, such as landing runway, including headwind or tailwind component, and runway slope, the runway surface condition, including field condition notums and the runway condition code, the weather conditions, type of precipitation at the field, and the forecast weather trends, the airplane's weight and configuration for landing, including the landing flap settings and the auto brake settings to be used, and the types of ground deceleration devices that will be used during the landing rollout, such as thrust reversers. When making the assessment, you should consider how much deterioration in the runway's condition you'll tolerate before deciding it's no longer suitable for landing. You can choose another runway at the same airport, or decide to divert to another airport. In other words, plan ahead. Establish bottom lines in terms of runway condition codes or pilot braking action reports, below which a landing on that runway is no longer safe. That kind of advanced planning gives you the information you need to make a quick decision to continue or divert. The pilot's runway condition assessment matrix will help you make your landing distance assessment. The matrix describes the runway conditions associated with each runway code and pilot braking action. It also describes the expected airplane deceleration and controllability for each code or braking action. This helps pilots apply their previous experience with stopping the aircraft under the same reported conditions. Pilots can use the matrix to compare the runway codes against the braking action reported by other pilots who've just landed. This can provide confidence that runway conditions remain acceptable or alert you that the runway conditions are deteriorating. When runway conditions deteriorate, pilot braking action reports help you evaluate how bad the runway's condition is, providing you with a better idea of the stopping performance you can expect on that runway and whether it remains acceptable for landing. This is important. Exercise caution when basing a landing distance assessment only on pilot braking action reports, especially when the braking action shows improvement over the reported runway code. Using a better braking action report for your assessment may be appropriate when weather conditions are improving. But if the weather's not improving and you expect precipitation to continue, it may be safer to use the reported runway condition code for the landing assessment. You should also evaluate the landing distance you'll need in case another pilot reports braking action lower than what you've anticipated given the reported runway condition code. One more thing. Don't use the matrix to adjust the runway condition code based on the contaminants reported in the field condition notum. Based on their observations, or with evidence from high or low friction measurement readings, the airport operator may upgrade or downgrade the runway code reported in the notum. The TAPA committee and the FAA agreed that operating rules in Part 121, 135, and 91K concerning landing at the destination airport or the alternate airport are adequate for basing a time of arrival landing distance assessment on a dry runway or a wet runway that has grooved or PFC surfaces, provided the assumptions used at the time of dispatch remain valid at the actual time of arrival. Part 91 operators may also apply this same assessment method. Remember the operating rules for Parts 121, 135, and 91K operators limit the takeoff weight of the airplane so that on arrival it can stop within 60% of the runway's available landing distance. Additional runway is required at the destination airport if the runways are forecast to be wet or slippery at the time of arrival. Remember. The operating rules for Part 121, 135, and 91K operators limit the takeoff weight of the airplane so that on arrival it can stop within 60% of the runway's available landing distance. 
Additional runway is required at the destination airport if the runways are forecast to be wet or slippery at the time of arrival. Part 135 and Part 91K operators are allowed an option to stop within 80% of the runway's landing distance available when they can also meet additional operating and training requirements set by the FAA. This option leaves only 20% of the runway's remaining length available to address any performance variables that occur during the approach and landing. And this is without adding the 15% safety margin recommended by the FAA. The additional training and operating procedures required by the FAA to use the 80% option help to ensure that it remains suitable for the landing assessment when the runway is dry. However, when the runway is wet, the 80% option is inadequate even if the runway is grooved or has a PFC surface. When landing on a wet runway with these surfaces, base your assessment on using the 60% option. If the wet runway has a smooth surface, use wet runway landing performance data corresponding to a runway condition code of 5. A runway contaminated with water, snow, slush, ice, or a combination of those elements presents a greater challenge when stopping the airplane. The landing margins provided by the dispatch rules we just talked about have also proven inadequate when landing on runways contaminated with these elements. The FAA recommends you make your assessment using data based on, or at least consistent with, the recommendations in the new advisory circular on landing performance data for time of arrival landing performance assessments. It's easier to make this assessment when you base the landing distance data on FAA's latest guidance because these distances are based on the reported runway condition code or braking action. That allows you to quickly decide whether the landing runway is adequate. This landing distance data should also include an adequate safety margin, which the FAA considers to be at least 15%. Some manufacturers elect to publish a distance without a safety margin, leaving the amount of safety margin to apply up to the discretion of the operator. When the landing data follows FAA's latest guidance, you can determine the landing distance required based on either the reported runway condition code or the reported braking action. You can also determine the minimum acceptable runway condition code or braking action for landing early enough so that if these conditions deteriorate, you can request a different landing runway or divert to a more suitable airport. For some older airplanes still in service, the manufacturer might not have provided advisory data for a time of arrival assessment. This is especially true for planes made by companies that no longer exist. In this case, the FAA has published a table of landing distance factors for use with the dry runway unfactored landing distance data found in the airplane flight manual. These factors include a 15% safety margin along with an air distance representative of normal operational practices. To find the landing distance required, multiply the dry runway unfactored landing distance by the factor associated with the runway condition code or braking action report. Different factors for each code or braking action are furnished depending on whether maximum thrust reversers will be used during the stop and for modern turboprops with effective propeller disc braking. Be sure to use the factor appropriate for the aircraft you're flying. With a reported runway condition code of 3 and a dry runway unfactored landing distance of 2,500 feet, you'll need 6,250 feet to land, including that FAA-required 15% safety margin. Now that we know the landing distance required, we need to check whether the runway is long enough for our use. In this example, our arrival airport is Chicago Midway. The landing runway is 3-1 center. We can determine the length of the runway available for landing by looking at the Midway entry in FAA's chart supplement, or we can look on the additional runway description section of the Jefferson Airport chart. Referring to the chart supplement entry for runway 31 center, we see the landing distance available, the LDA, is 5,826 feet. With the airport reporting a runway condition code of 3 for this runway, we'll need at least 6,250 feet to land. This runway is not long enough for landing given the reported runway conditions. Since Midway's Runway 31 Center is too short for our use, we need to check the weather and runway conditions at other airports in the Chicago area. Here we see the ATIS for O'Hare, 
The weather is above landing minimums and the runway condition codes for the landing runways 9 left and 10 center are 333. The shortest runway of these two is 9 left, which has an LDA of 7,500 feet. This runway is acceptable for the reported codes. 10 center would be acceptable as well. Even if we determine that a runway is long enough for the reported code, we should consider the possibility that conditions might get worse before we land. This is where we can draw our bottom line, based on the lowest condition code or breaking action level where landing becomes unacceptable. Should the runway condition code deteriorate to 2, or should pilots report breaking action as medium to poor, our landing distance factor increases to 2.9 and our landing distance increases to 7,250 feet. This is still less than the LDA for runway 9 left. However, if the code decreases to 1 or the braking action deteriorates to poor on this runway, the landing distance factor increases to 3.4. The landing distance required increases to 8,500 feet, which is far more than the LDA for 9 left. If an aircraft with similar performance to ours reports a braking action of poor, we need to request a different runway at O'Hare. Runway 10 Center is also available and it has an LDA of 10,540 feet. This runway is suitable even if its braking action is also reported as poor. This is a brief example of how the new runway condition codes and braking action reports are used along with the new landing distance data to assess the adequacy of runways under the current conditions and for determining how bad these conditions can deteriorate before the runway is no longer suitable for landing. No data is provided for nil braking conditions or for a runway condition code of zero. That's because these runways should be closed until their condition is improved. ATC will also cease operations to a runway with braking action reported as nil. Many manufacturers currently provide advisory performance data for takeoff and landing on a contaminated runway. This advisory data may be used for your time of arrival landing distance assessment, provided it accounts for the service conditions described in the runway condition assessment matrix, along with a few additional considerations expected by the FAA. While this advisory data may have been constructed using industry best practices at the time, it may not consider the many variables affecting normal landing operations. For example, this data may apply algorithms to the dry runway landing distance data determined during certification for various contamination types. As a result, this advisory data may not meet all the requirements desired for landing distance data intended for the time of arrival assessment. Your airplane's manufacturer may be able to guide you in the appropriate use of this advisory data when performing a time of arrival landing assessment. Remember, the landing assessment process continues until the aircraft is safely on the ground. Be ready for any deterioration in runway conditions and braking action and have a plan ready just in case those conditions become worse. What you just saw is a representation of how the runway condition assessment matrix, together with the new runway condition codes and pilot braking action terms, are used with the airplane's performance data to help you make a well-reasoned assessment of your airplane's ability to safely take off or land. The time of arrival assessment gives you a good idea of the airplane's ability to stop given the reported condition or braking action. You, the pilot, are still responsible for making a safe landing. That safe landing involves performing the landing maneuver using the same procedures as those used to develop the operational landing distance data. Excessive speed crossing the threshold, extending the landing flare to achieve a smooth touchdown, delayed application of spoilers or thrust reversers, or delayed application of manual braking, all extend the air distance to touchdown or the distance required to bring the airplane to a stop. If the landing assessment is based on using maximum reverse thrust, but you only use idle reverse, then a stopping distance could be much longer than planned, especially with the lower runway condition codes or with reduced braking action. If you're going too fast over the threshold or if you can't make the assumed touchdown point, your best option may be to go around and try again. The pilot's role in Talpa doesn't end when the airplane exits the runway. 
While the airport operator is responsible for assessing the runway's condition, pilots are responsible for providing accurate braking action reports that help validate the runway's condition. These reports provide critical feedback about the accuracy of the assigned codes when it comes to actual braking performance. These reports are passed along to other pilots landing at the airport and to the airport operator. To the landing pilot, they can provide a degree of confidence about their own runway assessment, or these reports can serve as a warning that the runway's condition is getting worse. Of course, when the runway is busy, it's harder to make those critical inspections. In fact, the airport operator may have to schedule them along with arrivals. For that reason, airport operators rely on braking action reports to confirm the runway's condition is not deteriorating and that the reported runway code remains valid. However, when braking action reports suggest the reported codes no longer match the runway's true condition, the airport operator may downgrade the codes until the runway's condition can be improved. FAA's new braking action terms now closely associate stopping performance and controllability with the runway's contaminants and condition codes. Whenever ATC reports braking action advisories are in effect, pilots should provide a braking action report. This is especially important when your braking experience is different than what you expected, given the reported runway condition code. The good news is that these new terms are included in the pilot's version of the runway condition assessment matrix. When it's safe and appropriate to do so, you can refer to this matrix to help describe the airplane's deceleration and direction control during your landing. We want to emphasize when it's safe and appropriate to do so. Don't jeopardize aircraft control or safety during taxi to make the report. Give your braking action report only when it's safe for you to do so. Another important thing, you should correctly judge the airplane's deceleration relative to the amount of wheel braking used during the stop. Some airplanes can be slowed using highly effective thrust reversers. You might hardly touch the wheel brakes until you reach taxi speeds. And while the overall stopping performance of your airplane might appear to be good using thrust reversers alone, that doesn't equal good wheel braking action. You might not achieve the same deceleration using wheel brakes alone, especially when runway contaminants don't impinge against the fuselage and wings. As a pilot, you must be familiar with your airplane and know the amount of deceleration provided for the wheel brakes applied when stopping on a dry runway. This allows you to accurately judge the reduced deceleration when stopping on a contaminated runway, when the wheel brakes are not as effective as they are on a dry runway. Many airplanes aren't equipped with thrust reversers or limit the amount of reverse that might be used because of directional control. These airplanes rely more on wheel braking and spoilers to stop. An overly optimistic braking action report may adversely affect another flight crew's landing assessment of a contaminated runway, especially if their airplane relies on deceleration devices that differ from yours. Have a good idea of what normal deceleration feels like in your airplane when stopping on a dry runway. Judge your deceleration when stopping on a contaminated runway based on the amount of wheel brakes applied. Then, use the observed level of deceleration along with the RCAM to make an accurate braking action report. Before we close, let's talk about situations where the airplane doesn't behave as planned. A landing under these circumstances might involve emergency or abnormal procedures. There are times when the pilot needs to know the actual landing distance required in an abnormal landing configuration. The airplane's emergency or abnormal checklist may provide correction factors to the airplane's dry runway unfactored landing distance to address these configurations. Depending on the situation, the pilot in command may decide that it's safer to land immediately without any added safety margins rather than staying in the air to burn off fuel, reduce landing weight, and shorten the landing distance required. The recommendation for a time-of-arrival landing assessment is not meant to influence the pilot-in-command's decision to land when the situation warrants using the actual landing distance without safety margins. In this briefing, we've seen how the new field condition notams and runway condition codes are used during takeoff and landing performance planning. 
the type of contamination reported along with its depth can help you determine your takeoff performance when the runway is contaminated. The new field condition notams should closely match the contaminated runway takeoff data provided for your airplane. The runway condition codes and braking action reports help the pilot make a time of arrival landing performance assessment on a contaminated runway. For manufacturers who have elected to comply with the new TALPA guidance, landing distance data may be provided that directly refers to these codes and braking actions. For older airplanes without such data, you can multiply the dry runway unfactored landing distance found in your AFM by the FAA's landing distance factors for a given runway code or braking action. The resulting landing distance required includes the FAA's recommended 15% safety margin and can help you decide whether the runway is long enough given the reported conditions or braking action. Your landing assessment should establish the minimum acceptable runway condition code or braking action for the landing runway. If the condition code or braking action falls below this minimum, consider a different runway for landing or diverting to an airport that offers better conditions. This landing assessment is not a one-time check, but instead is an ongoing evaluation that continues until you're fully stopped. The runway assessment process depends on pilots furnishing accurate braking action reports. Other pilots landing on the same runway use these reports to validate the runway's condition code and their own landing assessment. Airport operators match these reports against their own runway assessment, the current reported code, and whether they need to downgrade the code until they can improve the runway's condition. By submitting braking action reports, pilots play a critically important role in the runway condition assessment process and play a very important part in preventing runway excursions. This concludes our TALPA briefing.